all too angry. Good morning and welcome. Good we're, morning. we're so happy to have you this morning. Um, I will let you know that um, we had a wonderful attendance uh, at the early service, which always means a lower attendance here. So sorry about that. But uh, we did, did have several people who normally come to this service uh, uh, that attend that one. And we had almost 20 there this morning. So that's really, that's a great attendance for them. Uh, we have one meeting this week. That is the uh, property meeting Tuesday night at 7. Also, as you saw in the announcements, there are our little sign-up sheets out here. As you leave this morning, please, please consider signing up to uh, contribute to the uh, picnic. In, uh, the, on the last Sunday of July, it'll be picnic day. No one will be here in the sanctuary at all. We'll be downstairs at 1030. Both, both services will be smushed together and we'll do something. Um, we'll do something. Anyway, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be fun and we will uh, worship together. I'd like to, last week, I forgot to welcome people in the parking lot because I thought everybody was inside, um, but I was wrong and there were people out there. So hello if there's a, anyone out in the parking lot. Of course, this week there's not, yeah. Now I knew when I saw the weather forecast, at, at 4 a.m., I was already up, but at 4 a.m. we got a flash flood warning uh, that ran through the, and through the afternoon, I thought, well, there will be the hearty few at church this morning. So thank you for, for coming. I appreciate your presence. Um, I also want to remind you that uh, just sign up and, and let people know that you're coming and what you might be interested in helping with. We still need... Um, we still need help with a few things for that event, and, and we'll be so happy to have you all with us together. It's a fun day to spend together. Um, I believe those are all the announcements. I have been uh, neglectful in not uh, acknowledging that Zach Borger made, uh, makes these announcements possible. 
Um, and so yay for him. I have done those in the past. I know that it's... They're no fun, but I am appreciative, Zach. And it's, it's a, you've done such a good job with those. I know people so appreciate um, having them and having the, the pictures during the sermon helps, I know. Um, so thank you very, very much. We should have said that at the very beginning. I'm so sorry. Um, so today we hear about Tamar and Tamar. I, uh, I'll call her both in the sermon because I'm not really sure. They're both correct, and I, I learned one way, and then in seminary learned another way, and, uh, you know, I just go back and forth. Also, uh, we'll be hearing about some interesting people from, the, from God's early parts of the Bible. It's, uh, it, 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 I will tell you, uh, my husband said, uh, my husband picked up my uh, sermon off the printer early this morning and was like, well, this is thicker than normal. And uh, so prepare yourselves. Everyone, it was very, very well received at the first service, so everyone commented on it. So you have that to look forward to, too, so there. Um, but we, I hope that you join with us this morning and join with me as we, together, worship God Almighty. And now I invite you to please rise in body or spirit. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. We bring our hopes and fears, our struggles and our lives as they are into the presence of the one who leaves doors and futures open to gracious possibilities. God's word lies the past before us. May this time of worship empower us to make faithful choices. 
God's word lights the paths before us. May this time of worship renew and restore our relationships with God and each other. God's word lights the paths before us. By withholding his son, Sheila, from Tamar, Judah sins against her. Powerless to oppose him legally, Tamar must resort to subterfuge to achieve what is justly hers. God's word is like the rain that waters the earth and brings forth vegetation. It is also like the sower who scatters seed indiscriminately. Our lives are like seeds sown in the earth. Even from what appears to be little, dormant or dead, God promises a harvest. Let us pray. Light up, Light up our, our path, path, God, God of, of peace, with, with voices of our ancestors, whispering and singing hope and encouragement. Remind us that the union they found in their spirits can illuminate this moment. In their wisdom, we can see wholeness in your spirit and find peace in your presence. Hold us together from generation to generation as the joy in your heart. It is, it is rocky ground, and we, we know, know we cannot grow here. Show us, God of peace, the way of love through every division. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we encounter in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you, eager to hear your word. Open our eyes and ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit, May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May they, May take, they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good, good words and deeds. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and savior. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of our neighbors. God of peace, we come before you, scattered in the present and separated from our past. We play favorites when we should hold, hold grudges instead of forgiveness and fail to do the work of healing and reconciliation so needed in your word. It is rocky ground, and we know we cannot grow here. Show us, God of peace, the way of love, through every division. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Hear the promises of God, my friends, through all these divisions. Amidst all these separations, God offers the Spirit's transformative power for our companion, guide, and hope. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen.
seated. <clears throat> the Old Testament reading is from Genesis chapter 38. Genesis 38 breaks into the Joseph narrative with a bold, complicated, very broken story. Joseph is sold into slavery, and the very next verse we read is about his brother Judah. Judah was one of Leah's sons, and Leah the wife that Jacob didn't love. Judah was also the patriarch of the lineage of King David and Jesus. So this story and Judah's legacy isn't as much an interjection as an interlude that gives us a glimpse of God's grace and the amazing ways his promises were fulfilled despite all sorts of human interference. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she put off her widow's garments, put on a veil, wrapped, her, wrapped herself up, and sat down at the entrance to Enam, which is on the road to Timnah. She saw that Sheila was grown up, yet she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He went over to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come in to you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a kid from the flock. And she said, only if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and the staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she got up and went away and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, has prostituted herself. Moreover, she is pregnant as a result of prostitution. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law. It was the owner of these who made me pregnant. And she said, take note, please, whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah acknowledged them and said, she is more in the right than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila, and he did not lie with her again. The reading of this Psalm, Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest Psalm. It is a hymn in praise of and appreciation for God's instructions to the people. You see, God not only called Israel to be God's people and gave them a wonderful land, but God gave them a blueprint for living. The Hebrew word for that is Torah, sometimes translated law or teachings. In Torah, God tells them how to structure their lives and communities so that they will live long, prosperous lives in the land God has given them. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and I am determined to your righteousness. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, Accept the Lord, the, Lord, the willing and the truth of my lips, and teach me your judgments. My life is always in danger, yet I do not forget your teaching. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commands. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Sam. You're welcome. Listen to the gospel of Sorry, I'm skipping. In Matthew's gospel, both Jesus and his disciples sow the seed of God's word by proclaiming the good news that the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, in a memorable parable, Jesus explains why this good news produces different results in those who hear.
Listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great numbers gathered around him that he got into the boat and sat there while the crowd, the whole crowd, stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell upon the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where he did not have much, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up. Since they had no depth of soil, though, they, when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares of the world. And the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, in, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the good news. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let's be in the spirit of prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for planting us in the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy. Live according to it and grow in faith and hope and love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. She's one of the best known authors alive today. She's sold six, in excess of 600 million books. Her life has been a true rag to riches story. She went from losing her mother, going through a divorce, living on social assistance to becoming one of the top 200 richest people in Britain. She became a billionaire She's not one any longer because she's given so much of her money away in good ways. She's actually been named the number one most influential women in Britain. She knocked off Victoria Beckham as number two and the queen as number three to take number one spot. But she didn't get there without rejection in fact, her first series of books was rejected by many, many publishers up to the point where she almost didn't submit them another time. But even after she became one of the world's best known writers, she was rejected, she was attacked, advised to take a writing course. Her name is J.K. Rowling the author of the Harry Potter series of books. We love an underdog story, right? We love stories like Rowling's because it's one thing for people who are already rich and successful to get ahead. They had it all to begin with, so it's no big surprise. But the real surprise comes when a person who has nothing going for them and still ends up accomplishing something amazing. It gives us hope that the same thing might be possible for us too. That's actually why we're 
looking, we've spent a few weeks looking at some of the hidden figures of the Bible. They're unlikely heroes. We tend to think that God uses the successful, the gifted, those who are the most likely to succeed. But we're going to see that God actually uses some of the most unlikely people, the ones who had nothing going for them, the ones who actually would have been voted least likely to succeed. Today, we're going to look at a very, at a very sad and seedy story. It's one of those stories that's deeply disturbing as you read it. In fact, I don't think I've ever, I know I've never preached a sermon on this passage. I'm not even sure I've ever heard one. It's one of those passages that we tend to skip over. Some people have struggled with this passage so much that they even wonder what it's doing in the Bible. So let me tell you the story and then let me tell you what I think we can learn from it. You heard the story read already. Now this is not one of the scriptures that's ever going to be a Sunday school favorite. One report says that this is this particular story in Genesis 38 is among the top 10 in the Bible that pastors tend to skip right over. You can understand why you heard it. Sounds like an episode of Jerry Springer. This story is set in the context of a pretty amazing story though. God graciously called a family, Abraham's family, to God's self to be a people and become a nation that would bless the entire world and change history. The overall context of this story is amazing. God could have written humanity off, but he chose not to. Instead, he chose to love humanity and to begin a plan for our rescue. The big story of this, the picture of this story continues to be hopeful. But the minute we get to look at the characters in detail in this particular scripture, we start to get a little bit depressed. These are the people that God chooses, we ask. What hope is there with people like this? But that's the point. This looks like it came from a bad situation in a horrible, horrible daytime talk show. It doesn't get much worse than this. It begins with Abraham's great-grandson, Judah. We're still in the early stages of God forming this family into a nation that will one day bless the whole earth. But already things have gone horribly wrong in just a couple of generations. Abraham's great-grandsons have already sold off one of their brothers out of jealousy. They're about to begin another tragic episode. In fact, this story seems to interpret the bigger story, which is a bit of a clue, so pay attention. Because whenever that happens, we know something's going on in the text. Now, Abraham had warned his family that they should not marry Canaanites. That sounds weird to us today. And it has nothing to do with interracial marriage as it's sometimes interpreted. It was because back in Genesis 9, God cursed the Canaanites. And it was because the Canaanites had a completely different set of values. They were known for being immoral. Abraham knew his descendants couldn't serve God and embrace the Canaanite culture at the same time. But here we see Judah blatantly ignoring Abraham and God's suggestion and marrying a Canaanite woman. Not only that, but his kids were clearly messed up as well. Now, this isn't a very stellar family. You're not going to be putting them on on, you know, primetime TV. Verse 7 says to us, But Ur, who was Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of God, and God put him to death. Lots of 
couples talk about the struggles of that first year of marriage, but Tamar's marriage must have been a nightmare. I mean, if God puts your husband to death right after you marry him, it sort of dashes any hopes you have, right? Any girlish hopes that that woman had were quickly shattered, I think, by life with her new husband. The scripture tells us her new husband was wicked in God's sight. It doesn't give us any other gruesome details. No one spared Tamar, however. She had to live every single day with his wickedness. Now, you can imagine that a dull and unhappy marriage would be bad enough. But marriage to someone who is truly wicked and evil in God's sight puts her in a league all her own. No one knows what she suffered exactly, but suffer she clearly did. And her husband's wickedness was so terrible that God stepped in and took him. That wasn't a good situation for Tamar, but then things got even worse. There was something back then called Leverite marriage. It meant that if a husband died without an heir, the husband's brother was to marry a, the widow and produce an heir for him by proxy. If the brothers weren't able to do this, it seems that the, from Deuteronical law that the father may take, sometimes take on the role. This sounds bizarre to us today. But back in the patriarchal society, this custom was designed to actually protect the woman, ensuring that she had a male provider and protector. And it also ensured the continuance of the family line and that the land would be passed down to the next generation. Later on, this would become the law of Israel. But this Leverite marriage law, well, it's invoked here. Ur's brother Onan marries Tamar, but he refuses to allow her to get pregnant. He just uses her. It could be that he's protecting his larger share of the inheritance, because if Tamar comes, becomes pregnant with a son, then that son is recognized as his, their father's heir, and he gets the larger share of the inheritance. It doesn't make financial sense for Onan to allow her to have a child, so he doesn't. I'll spare the details, but if you want them, they're in chapter 38, Genesis, and it's pretty juicy, so you might want to go read it. Anyway, God kills him for doing what he does, and Tamar has now lost two husbands at a very young age, and she's still childless. And then things get even worse. Even though in the Bible we know that her two husbands were evil, Judah doesn't seem to understand that his sons were responsible and to blame, and that God was responsible for their deaths. He treats Tamar like damaged goods. Now he does have another son, by, so by Leverite law he's supposed to give her in marriage to him, to continue the line, but he sends her back to her father's house, destitute to live as a widow. Now, she could have, if he had released her from her bonds, she could have remarried someone else and had a life, but Judah didn't choose to do that. So to live as she did, with no man whatsoever, means that she was living without legal, without economic, or without social status. She's been sidelined without any recourse. And it's hard for us to picture how damaging this might have been for the young woman. She has no money, she has no options, and she has no hope. I mean, this is far worse than losing a job. This is losing all hope, losing all ability to ever, ever have another job. That would be bad, but that's not even as bad as what she faced. Now, this is already a weird story, but
but it gets even stranger at this point. Judah's wife eventually dies. Tamar hears the news and decides to take matters into her own hands. She goes to Timnah, dresses up like a prostitute. Now, Timnah, I should tell you, Timnah is the, uh, it's sort of like the Vegas of the early world. And what happened in Timnah apparently stayed in Timnah. But they did, they, it was a Canaanite town where temple prostitutes were a thing. And uh, apparently Judah has done this before because she knows that this will work. Anyway, she puts a veil on, takes off her widow's clothes. Judah propositions her and Tamar becomes pregnant by her father-in-law and finally, at long last, gets not one son, but two that she's been denied. Finally, she has some options. Now, when Judah discovers that she's pregnant, just like Judah, to be all hypocritical, he says she should be killed until he realizes that he's the father. And she eventually delivers and has two twins. It's a disturbing story, and no wonder we don't hear a lot about it. But there are lots more disturbing stories in the Bible. And it's hard to first understand what hope there might be in this story. As we think about this, let's look at two lessons that we learn. You know, one of the reasons that I'm so drawn, I think, to this particular story is that we all have CD stories in our past. We all have parts of our histories that we would like to erase. Not just to us, but our families. You know, there's a lot of heartbreak. And I think one of the reasons it's important to talk about these particular stories is because this one is not sanitized and neither are our lives. I'm so glad that the Bible is honest about when lives get really messy. So as we look at this story, I think we can learn at least two important lessons. One is that God works in the worst circumstances to accomplish God's purposes. Remember, this is not just any ordinary tale. This is the story of a family that God chose to bless the world. Not only that, but Tamar's story becomes an important story of that, uh, an important part of that story. Because through Judah, she has twins, Perez and Zerah. Centuries later, both Tamar and Perez show up in Jesus' genealogy in Matthew 1-3. That's remarkable. Tamar and her child become not only a part of the best story in the world, but they become a part <clears throat> of the means by which God creates a family line that leads to our brother and savior, Jesus, being born. As the descendants of Abraham mushroomed into a nation, the bloodline of her eldest son, Perez, became the golden cord that connected God's promise of a redeemer in Eden with the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem thousands of years later. The crowning glory of Tamar's efforts came when the name Jesus was inscribed on the Perez branch of Judah's family tree. God is at work in our stories, even in our messy ones. God doesn't just use us when we're at our very best and when things are going great. God uses us even in the hard and difficult times of our lives. Nothing, nothing, nothing is out of God's control. In this way, it's possible to see all of life as the medium of God's activity. He is not just active when we read our Bible or pray. He's all, God is also active when we're living in the world. Hence, when we wake up tomorrow, we don't wake up to a day without God. Tomorrow is God's day, for God made it. God formed it, and God works in it. And what's more, he wants you and I to enter tomorrow determined 
to be the best person that we can be, the pe person that God created us to be. Do we have hard things in our lives? Of course we do. Don't think that God can't use us and can't use them because God works in the worst circumstances to accomplish his purposes. This is never more true, by the way, than when God's own son, Jesus, is killed. There has never been a greater injustice than what was committed on that day. And yet God used that injustice to bring about our salvation. Jesus' death led to our deliverance. God turned the greatest injustice to the greatest triumph. All who trust in Jesus know that Jesus bore our sins, dying the death that we should have died. His death became our greatest hope. God works in the worst circumstances to accomplish God's purposes. And God continues to do that today. And God also works in the worst circumstances to transform our characters. God was accomplishing something in history in this story. But God was also accomplishing something in the lives of two characters. Tamar and Judah. First, let's look at Tamar. If you see her as an evil woman, and that's how she's been painted throughout the years, as a woman who manipulated Judah, then you miss the point entirely. Tamar is a remarkable woman who starts out as a victim and ends up being praised. In verse 26, Judah says of her, she is more righteous than I. Why? Tamar wasn't perfect. Yes, she was deceptive, but otherwise she acted on behalf of herself in a way that was brave. Tamar was within her rights. She did nothing that the law did not entitle to her to. In fact, later on, she's praised. In the beautiful story of Ruth, the townspeople bless Boaz and Ruth, saying, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that God will give you by this young woman. And Tamar's name appears both in Matthew, as I mentioned, and later on in 1 Chronicles. At a time when women are rarely mentioned, Tamar gets mentioned a lot. Tamar uses strong women by his grace and accomplishes God's purposes through them. But God also uses Tamar to transform Judah. Up until this point, there is nothing redeeming about Judah. He led the charge in sailing, selling Joseph into slavery. His sons are wicked. He was clearly happy to go along with the prostitute, even if he probably wouldn't have had he known it was his daughter-in-law. And yet the next time we see him after this experience, the next time we see him, he remarkably offers up his life in exchange for that of his half-brother. It seems that Judah may have changed. And if he did, it's possible that this incident with Tamar was the turning point. God uses stories all the time. And he uses this one not only to shape the course of history, but to shape the characters of both Tamar and Judah. So if you hear nothing else today, hear these words. God works in the worst events of our lives both to accomplish his purposes and to transform our characters. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I can tell you this. Don't ever, ever think that God has left you alone or that God isn't at work in you and that God isn't pulling for you with all God's might. And if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? No, says it, it says in Romans, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
the letter to the Romans goes on to say, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ through Jesus, our brother and savior. May it be so, amen. Together, let us use the words of the, of the Apostles' Creed to state that which we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Confident that God receives our joys and our concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. Guide your church, O God, to sow seeds of forgiveness and righteousness on good soil. Direct your people to proclaim your love in this congregation and throughout the world. Hear us, O God. In mercy, pray. Sustain your creation, O God, by sending favorable weather, 
causing trees and fields to grow, protecting waterways from pollution, and instilling in all people the need to be good stewards. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Maintain peace among all people, O God, and raise up lawyers <clears throat> to work for justice in the courts, advocates to speak for the downtrodden, and politicians to work on behalf of the common good. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heal those who are sick, O God, especially those on our prayer list. Guide health care workers to care for those who suffer, scientists to conduct life-saving research, and counselors to care for victims of sexual abuse and exploitation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Answer the prayers of those gathered and worship, O God. Protect those who travel near and far. Accompany visitors to this congregation and nurture our faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Inspire us by the faithful departed, O God, examples of your embodied love, whose confidence in the resurrection guides us in living lives worthy of the gospel. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God. We commend all for whom we pray in the name of the one who reconciled all of creation to himself, Jesus our Savior. Amen. This is how the earth praises God, giving thanks for God's abundance. The meadows clothe themselves with flock and the valleys deck themselves with shimmering fields of grain, sharing their body bounty with the rest of creation. We too worship God by being abundant and fruitful with our lives, offering up our yields as if they were songs of joyful praise. Let us worship God with our joyful gifts. Good morning. Good morning. This morning as we're taking this forward to what pieces of music David studied in his youth, we're going with a composer that we're not familiar with. I mean, we always know the Bach, Chopin, Beethoven, and by the way, Beethoven's next week, but it's the Bailey's. And this is one like, you might recognize the name, but not know as much about it. Gene Sibelius is Finnish, uh, from Finland, but he was there before it was Finland, and then once it was Finland. What, what, what kind of what's going on in the world now today, we've been hearing more about Finland with, with NATO and stuff, but it's a country we know little about. Basically, Finland has been, for most of its history, has been ruled by other people. Beginning in the end of the 1200s, it became part of the Swedish Empire, and for five, six hundred years, it was part of the Swedish Empire. Then in all of the European fighting in the early 1800s, Sweden lost a major battle to the uh, Russian Empire, and part of the negotiation, uh, Finland was kind of handed off to the Russian uh, Empire, and kind of around 1800, and existed then for the next 100 years. But this planted a seed in Finland uh, that perhaps our, our own destiny, freedom, is a possibility. It took over 100 years. Um, Sibelius became a national hero. One of his hymns that we say years under other people, 
Let us pray together. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us, that the world may be fed by your love. Through Jesus Christ, our brother and savior. Amen. All people are called to Christ's table. Come, eat what is good. The God of seasons be with you. And also with you. Heirs of the promise, offer your hearts to God. We lift them to the one who sows seeds of grace in us. May hope and wonder be on your lips this day. We sing songs of grace and love to the one who waters us with peace. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim. We praise your name and join their unending hymn. sisters and brothers in faith, we recall anew these words and acts of Jesus Christ. Now as they were, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, broke, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. And likewise, Jesus took the cup, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. We remember Christ's promise not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until the heavenly banquet at the close of history. And we say boldly what we believe. Christ, Christ died, severely afflicted for, for our, our sake. sake. Christ, Christ rose, given life according to your promise. Christ, Christ will return, holding our lives in his hands forever. Holy God, creator of all people and world, send now upon this bread and cup your life-giving spirit. May this outpouring of the promised spirit transfigure this Thanksgiving meal, that this bread and this cup may become for us the body and blood of Christ. As we partake of this meal, Fill us with the Holy Spirit that we may be one body, one spirit in Christ. All glory and honor is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And hear us now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive, forgive those who sin against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And ever. Amen. O Lamb of God, you bear the sins of all the world away. You suffer death our lives to save. Have mercy now, we pray. O Lamb of God, you bear the sins of all the world away. You set us free from guilt and grave. Have mercy now, we pray. O Lamb of God, you bear the sins of all the world away. 
eternal, eternal peace with God you made. Have mercy now, we pray. You may be seated. The door to God's banquet hall is open. Enter into the joy of this feast. Saints of God, taste and see that God is good.
Sandy, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, broken and shed for you. Thanks be to God. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world throughout the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Go in peace, share the harvest. Thanks be to God.